<clears throat> Hello, uh, we'll talk today about uh, two architects, uh, Jürgen Meyer, a contemporary architect, and uh, Walter uh, Netsch, uh, a very important uh, North American architect who is not with us any longer, so to speak. But we'll start with Jürgen Meyer, uh, an architect who is, uh, I think, uh, one of the more interesting architects today. And here it is what he says, architecture happens because we believe in a better future. It sounds predictable, in a way it is predictable, but I think it is important to, uh, uh, to be reminded sometimes that we are not here just to respond to the less more, less capricious, uh, uh, you know, uh, desires of a certain client, but indeed to work for a better life better from all points of view, not just functional. Aesthetical, uh, you know, uh, now, of course, uh, we have the pressing issues of, of uh, ecology, of uh, sustainability, the climate change, and so on. We should never ignore these things in the present. But uh, let's, uh, let's uh, see a little bit the works of this um, interesting German architect. So Jürgen Hermann Meyer was born in 1965 in Stuttgart. He's a German architect and artist. I will stress this, he's a German architect and artist, not an architect and a, an accountant or not an architect and a businessman or not an architect as a, and a financial speculator, but an architect and an artist. And I think we should remember this, that architecture was until very recently, the queen of the arts. That's how it was called. And we should never forget that there is an artist in most of us. And that artist should be brought to life if that artist is rather somnolent. He's the leader of the architecture firm J. Meyer H. Uh, from Hermann, that H in Berlin, and calls himself Jürgen Meyer H. Uh, he studied at Stuttgart University, the Cooper Union, and Princeton University in the United States. Uh, since 1996, he has been working as an architect. Recent national and international projects include Metropol uh, Parasol, the redevelopment of the Plaza of, of de la Encarnacion in Seville, Spain, the Court of Justice in Hassel, Belgium, Pavilion K300, built in celebration of Karlsruhe's 300th Jubilee, and several public and infrastructural projects in Georgia. This is very interesting that Georgia, which is a country that, uh, you know, uh, lived in the shadow of uh, the Soviet Union and still does to an extent, is very, very emancipated um, in terms of education and very, very emancipated in terms of architecture. I think it is an example for us living here in Southeastern Europe. So for example, an airport in Mestia, the border checkpoint in Sarpia anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll see some of his works. His work has been published and exhibited worldwide and, worldwide and is part of numerous collections, including the Museum of Modern Art in New York, Museum of Modern Art in San Francisco, private collections. National and international awards include the Miss Van der Rohe Award Emerging Architect Special Mention 2003. Uh, anyway, I'm not going to read all these um, uh, prizes. He has taught at Princeton University, Harvard, Berlin University, the Technical University of Munich, the Architectural Association in London, the Columbia University, New York City, University of Toronto, and so on. This is the man the architect and the artist. And again, it's important, I think, to remind ourselves that there is an artist within ourselves. And yes, he was an artist, he is an artist, and, 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 and it's good to be an artist. Uh, what would architecture be if we forget we are artists as well? Of course, architecture is a little bit different than art, but at its best is an art. Uh, what is this exhibited? Um, it's 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 a bit, one of his early works. Uh, you'll see that in time he becomes more and more uh, eccentric in a way and more and more free, uh, formally speaking. But even this building is uh, rather interesting uh, with its uh, 
ominous dark part of the top. The plan is very simple, but uh, you know the architecture has some uh, provocative elements, particularly the top part. Interesting also is the dialectic between black and white with, uh, with mediation of gray. So there is, uh, there is some tension at the level of, of the chromatics as well. And then there is the tension between the small spaces, uh, the periphery and the central space, which is the public space, the atrium, you know, which is cultural and it's, it's, uh, it's voluminous. Jürgen Meyer. Now a penthouse, uh, Denmark, 2004, 2006, but I don't have pictures. Uh, high school in Karlsruhe in Germany. Uh, we see that here he's exploring the structure of the building beyond the you know, Cartesian paradigm, already employing uh, you know, columns which are not uh, vertical, which is a good thing, you know, I think, to, to, to escape the monotony of excessive Cartesianism. And this happens also inside. So I think it's, it's important to understand the structure by itself is not enough. Uh, that's why important architects stress the fact that architecture and ornament should become one. And there are those who think that architecture should become, should attempt to become ornament or ornamental and the ornament should, be, should attempt to become structural. But structure and ornament should, should come together in as much as form and function, or function and form. But there is a capriciousness here, of course, because he could have, he could have used, uh, you know, regular equidistant uh, uh, vertical uh, columns. Why did he complicate himself? Why did he complicate the life of the engineers? Well, because uh, to arrive at, uh, at the level of art, this so-called complication is necessary. Otherwise, we die of boredom, and we don't want that. So this is a high school, believe it or not. I wish there was uh, some variation in the colors here, but Anyway, this was the choice, his choice or the choice of the administrators of the building or the clients or whatever. He's a, you know, a modern through and through architect uh, with some mundane, mundane elements in his architecture, some sleek elements as well. But we see that, that you know, he's flirting with uh, escaping the Cartesian paradigm despite the fact that here we see rooms that are not too removed from what we call uh, Cartesianism. And uh, you know, this, this architect, I think he built his most spectacular building in Spain. Now the temperament, the, but no, I shouldn't say so. What I wanted to say is that we have this maybe preconception that you know the Anglo-Saxons are rather cold and the, and the Latins are warm. But the truth is expressionism achieved its highest um, you know, uh, plateau of manifestation rather in the North than in the South. So the, beneath the appearance, uh, you know, uh, rigor and the coldness of the, of the North of Europe, actually sometimes um, hide, um, you know, uh, turbulent uh, forces. Uh, so it's enough to think of Edvard Munch, you know, the, the great Norwegian painter with his um, angst manifested through painting. But look at the structure. This is the structure of a man who obviously was not happy with the Cartesian paradigm and is trying to you know, complicate himself and the building and the builder's life. Metropolis Parasol, this is his probably his, his most famous work, although he did some remarkable things in, in Georgia, and we are going to see it, but uh, see them. But this is from 2004, 2011 in Seville, Spain. And 
I called the presentation today in, in relation with the, with the program of the students in the fourth year, uh, urban insertions. Well, this is an urban insertion, but you see it's an insertion which refuses to mimic what is around it. Quite the opposite, his urban insertion is uh, powerfully uh, itself in the sense that it asserts uh, uh, the, 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 you know, the architecture that uh, he wanted to implement in this space. And I think you can have harmony through contrast. And this is exactly what we have here. We have harmony through contrast. Uh, he could have mimicked the, the urban fabric uh, around this uh, square, but he didn't. And uh, I think he achieved a, a dynamic uh, architectural uh, expression, which is very stimulative. And this is the, the structure. This is the building. I think he did a good job. I'm not so sure about the platform, the pedestal on which this, um, you know, uh, rather baroque um, architecture stands. Maybe what is below is, is, uh, is less graceful, a little bit heavy and predictable. But all in all, I think he did a good job. And I'm, 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 I'm happy that Seville, uh, you know, built it because it's not a, you know, uh, a conventional structure at all. So it, it doesn't matter if you have a small uh, uh, building to build or, or a, a large building to build, if it is squeezed between two existing buildings or it is in a square like here, you can assert your creativity if you believe in what you are doing and you, you think you are doing the right thing. And I think he, he chose courageously something that, uh, that uh, actually works. And it works because, uh, because this, uh, this um, the dynamic uh, quality that he arrived at in, in, in this uh, urban context is uh, stimulative. I remember I keep quoting lately and not only lately from Einstein who was a scientist, as you know, he said, creativity is contagious, pass it on. Well, uh, uh, Jürgen Meyer was creative here and, and his creativity is contagious. And he, by looking at it and getting inspired, I think we could, uh, uh, you know, uh, it proves that what Einstein said is correct. Uh, creativity is contagious. I think the contrast between the, the existing uh, urban uh, context and the building he built, again, it's stimulative. And I, it's, it's stimulative because it is a contrast. And so uh, uh, this can be, can be observed even on a plate if you pre prepare a dinner, let's say, and you combine, let's say, I'm not at all uh, an expert in gastronomy. But I did notice that if you put on a plate, let's say a white plate, and you, you put some uh, green salad and some tomatoes, the tomatoes are red and the, and the salad is green. And, and because of the chromatics, green and red being opposite colors, all of a sudden the, the, the plate becomes a little bit more alive, I would say. And it's the same thing here because of the contrast between the existing uh, urban context and the building he built, uh, it's more appetizing, so to speak, the architecture of, from the dialectics between these two things. So here it is, here it was a, a German architect and artist who proposed this thing, it was accepted and it was built. So it's good to be courageous. It good, it's good to be creative. I go a little bit quicker because I, we have a lot to see. After um, Jürgen Meyer, we'll see um, Walter Netsch. And so we have as a total about 400 pictures to look at.
paranormal activity, metropole parasol. Uh, you see here we have this, um, you know, this word paranormal. What, what does it mean? Well, you know, maybe we, we all need to become para ourselves sometimes at least, you know, in other words, to get out of ourselves and, and uh, manifest ourselves uh, as, uh, you know, uh, transcending our own limits. What if you say para me, you know, or para Elena or para George or para uh, Mihai or whatever, you know, the to, to meaning is him or her, but a little bit different in what sense a little bit different in the sense of um, intensified uh, otherness, intensified uh, creativity. So you achieve the otherness through uh, creativity. Hello, Mr. Uh, Jürgen Meyer. Now, an office building in Hamburg. This one is less, um, you know, uh, flamboyant, but still, considering it's an, uh, an office building, he tries to, he tried to, you know, uh, have a little bit of a movement, at least on the elevations of the building. This is a university in Denmark. This one is again uh, adventurous and sculptural. I mean, who would think that this is a, uni a, a, a university? But that's what it is. Let's read again. Danfoss Universe, Universe, no. No, it's not an university, sorry. I, I was quick to read wrongly. It's, uh, it has a different function. Uh, it's not a university, some kind of a, um, I don't know, uh, cultural center uh, uh, where exhibitions take place and um, conferences and so on. It, it has an educational character, but the building is um, sculptural uh, through and through. Uh, here, he didn't have to confront a specific urban context, as you can see, but uh, I think he did a good job to 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 again, to, 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 to provoke a visual interest and to incite people to come in and, uh, you know, inside also a lot of things happen. Now, of course, the strict functionalists would protest. What are these things here? Why are they like this? You know, but again, form, form cannot leave function by itself. We need form in architecture. Formalism in itself is not a good thing, but if you have function and form come together and create a, um, a you know, a, a convincing architectural entity, then it's fine. So a building could look like this as well. Why not? And it does. But you'll see some other interesting things he built in Georgia. It does help an architect to not forget that he or she is also an artist. Have the courage to be artists. It's nothing wrong to be artist, quite the opposite, or an artist. It's nothing wrong, it's a privilege, but it's also a responsibility. If you, if you feel inside the burning desire to express artistically something, please don't restrict that burning desire allow it to manifest itself. Even if you commit mistakes, so-called mistakes, uh, they shouldn't be called mistakes. Again, I come back to Einstein who said, if you never made a mistake in your life, it means you never try something new. And we should all try something new. As Jürgen Meyer tried here. A private house in Germany, for my taste is too sleek. That whiteness is too white. Yes, for my taste is too sleek, but that's my taste. But the, the space is interesting, is uh, 
engaging is too bad that you know I I can only imagine you know uh, uh, how much work here is to be done to clean up that white path you know and border around the building and maybe even the the walls and so on. It's not a building that um, that uh, inspires me a lot because of it. That is very very slick. An opulent house, of course. Uh, of course, such a building has uh, at least one person or two or three who, who every day clean up the, the the magnificent whiteness of the building. Another office building in Hamburg, in Germany. Here we see another urban insertion. Uh, what do we see here? We see a building that is resolutely contemporary, but but is not mimicking the building on the right and the building on the left. So, of course, this is his proposal and that's what he built. Why did he have these diagonals here, these capriciously placed? Why not? Capriciousness is also part of art. And, uh, you know, it has to do with aesthetics. I call it formalism if you want, but uh, I, I think it is important not to forget that architecture is not just about function, it's also about form. And without form, it wouldn't be architecture. Now we arrive at this uh, spectacular building in Georgia, highway rest, uh, rest stop one and two, he built two, 2009, 2011. Look at this. This is on a highway, a rest stop. You know, you just uh, stop your car here and uh, <laughs> enjoy this uh, you know uh, sculptural uh, building and whatever functions it uh, it offers georgia apparently is in love with this german architect they commissioned him several times so jürgen meyer uh, is busy working in georgia too bad it uses a lot of concrete concrete is very polluting is a material sh that should be discouraged these days to be employed very often, really. If, if we care about the climate, if you care about sustainability, if we care about the ozone that we need badly in order to, to breathe, if we care about the high, rising levels of the seas and the, the melting of the ice, icebergs, we should employ concrete less and less, but to replace it with what? That's the problem. How could we replace the concrete? With what? We could replace it with wood, but wood means cutting down trees, and that's not good either. It's a dilemma. But one thing is for sure, concrete is a very polluting uh, material, because just producing the asphalt, not the asphalt, sorry, the cement, which is uh, unavoidable in, in, in making concrete, the cement is, 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 is very, very, very polluting. Another building in Georgia, border checkpoint. Uh, an extravagant structure. I mean, who would expect, you know, a border checkpoint to look like this? It's not for me a major architecture. I, 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 I don't sympathize with it uh, totally, but he tried something, you know, and uh, why not have at uh, the frontier a building that uh, provokes your curiosity and uh, you know, uh, makes you feel less uh, uh, frightened that you might have some bureaucratic problems with a passport or I don't know with what. Frontiers in general are, could be uh, angst, angst provoking. At least this was my experience at Nadlag between Romania and Hungary for many years, especially before 1989 when it was actually impossible to cross the frontier. Now, again, Georgia, an airport. Now you'll see the most unusual airport you ever saw. It's very small. It's a small building. It's who knows for what the, this Mestia is. This is the building. 
It's whimsical. It's uh, but but somehow, if you if you contemplate the curvature here, this is a building which uh, which uh, seems to suggest somehow the you know the taking off, flying. An incredible picture, no? This building and the animal in front of it. But they belong to two different worlds. But it shows even more how forward looking Georgia is. If they encourage this kind of architecture, uh, they hire Jurgen Meyer to build, uh, and this is not the last building we'll see by him in Georgia. Here is the plane, and on the right is the building, and you see, actually, you see some interesting old buildings, uh, especially the towers in the background as well. But again and again, he was not afraid to bring in the new Jürgen Meyer, not in an urban context, in a natural context, but he asserted his time. Many people, uh, especially the functionalists uh, who are trying hard to destroy architecture, would uh, comment negatively on, 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 on this corner and this corner. But I, I, I'm not sure they are right. I don't think they, they would be right. He wanted to express something. And I think what he wanted to express is this taking off. And uh, the building almost wants to take off by itself. Now, uh, sculpture in uh, again in Georgia from 2012, because as we read, he's not just an architect, but also an artist. There was a time maybe when, when you said, I'm an architect meant you are an artist as well. You didn't have to say I'm an architect and an artist. When you say I'm an architect means I am an artist as well. Otherwise, I wouldn't be an architect. Because as John Ruskin said, uh, in order to be an architect, you, are, you either have to be a good painter or a good uh, a sculptor. Now, I'm not so sure that things are quite like this, but I think the artistic side of architecture should be acknowledged. Because if architecture is not an art, then, then why is it present in all histories of, of art? What does architecture do in the histories of art if it's not an art? Interesting, these, um, you know, three variations of, of uh, you know, could, should, and would. Maybe we should we could reflect on them. I could, I should, I would. We could, we should, we would. Because reflecting on it, it might open a horizon of possibilities, which otherwise we we we, we regret. We, we might regret later for not uh, addressing. The, now you you'll arrive in another unusual building, a police station. A police station in the same place where he built a small uh, airport from 2012 in Georgia. Here it is. Why not? Why should a police station look, uh, you know, uh, frighteningly authoritarian and, uh, you know, uh, uh, oppressingly, uh, you know, uh, yeah. Uh, you know, pre-Doric or using columns, equidistant and heavy and, uh, you know, a building uh, like this one could suggest that uh, there are uh, pa some possible fluidities there that the windows represent, which could humanize a little bit the institution. Now, 
you know, these uh, Georgians, they are, they are, I, I read that uh, the level of education is very, very developed in Georgia. Uh, Finland is famous for having an excellent education, but Georgia is very close. And the architecture shows in a way, they are open-minded, they experiment and they hire Jürgen Meyer. Again, you know, the, the cow and, and, and the police station, the building with its, um, you know, uh, contemporary aesthetics. From the architects, the project is situated in the heart of the old town of Mestia next to the newly built city hall. Its tower-like shape pays homage to the medieval stone towers, which are traditional to Mestia's mountainside region. We saw them in the, when I showed the, uh, the airport. The facade is comprised of prefabricated texture, concrete and large openings, which offer a maximum of transparency. The plan is not extravagant. The section isn't either with the exception of, you know, the windows that are as they are. The cow and the police station in Georgia. Now, Georgian architecture, uh, I, I, I felt it's important to read a little bit about this. The World Bank dubbed Georgia the number one economic reformer in the world because it has in one year improved from rank 112 to 18th in terms of case of ease of doing business. And by 2020, further improved its position to six in the world. So from 112 to the six, as of 2021, it ranked 12th in the world for economic freedom, freedom, freedom. And this we should have also in education. In 2019, Georgia ranked 61st on the Human Development Index between 2000 and 2019. Georgia uh, Human Development Index, HDI, score improved by 17%. A factors contributed to HDI, Human Development Index, education had the most positive influence as Georgia ranks in the top quantile in terms of education. This is incredible and is beautiful. And it shows when the education is very experimental, very open-minded, very free and very creative, so is architecture and vice versa. The United, United Nations Development Program compiles the Human Development Index of 191 nations in the annual, annual Human Development Report. The index considers the health, education, and income in a given country to provide a measure of human development, which is comparable between countries and over time. Now, in terms of uh, health and income, they are not doing greatly, but education makes up for the difference because the education is very, very forward looking. Bravo to them. Georgian architecture after is this, uh, you know, the, was a presi the president of the country. I'm not very good at politics. This person, um, a lot of construction took place and look, they built uh, all kinds of, uh, you know, uh, rather extravagant uh, buildings which stimulate the economy, stimulate the imagination of people, stimulate the country to, to move forward. And that's why they hired uh, Hans Meyer. Uh, we see the old, the old buildings, now the traditional towns, the traditional town. But we see also the airport by... Uh, Jürgen Meyer, we see here a bridge. I don't know if it was built by him. Uh, the police station, uh, another building, which I don't know what it is. Uh, an office building, uh, I don't know what this is either. But anyway, it shows clearly that Georgia is attempting things, is trying new things, is open-minded, and that's good, I think. I mean, this you could have said is in Switzerland. No, uh, it's not in Switzerland, it's in Georgia.
these were not built by Jürgen Meyer. I just show a few things from Georgia to stimulate uh, the students here, the, um, you know, the border uh, office. Anyway, Court of Justice in Belgium, uh, he built um, Jürgen Meyer. This is not Georgia any longer, it's Belgium. Again, we see the exostructure, we see the, the enveloping structure, which is avoiding the, the vertical, the verticality of, um, you know, the, the columns as we, many people still uh, consider the only way to have a structure is not so. And this is not actually the most extravagant architecture. There are others, and we are going to see at the end of this presentation some things he did in, uh, in Florida. Somehow I like the mo model more than the building, but the model does express uh, you know, what was built. I like the diagonals because I think that diagonals in their rebelliousness amplify, intensify life, the visual life uh, as well, or starting with a space for experiments in Munich, 2012-2013. Here he employs, uh, you know, uh, Cartesian structural system, but he is able to, uh, you know. Uh, the top part of the structure of the building to uh, dematerialize everything. And it becomes indeed a space for um, experiments, open, Munich, Jürgen Meyer. The building as a, as a scaffolding, why not? Continuously changing. An office and residential building in Vienna in Germany Obviously, he dislikes the typical, uh, you know, colonnade of uh, vertical columns with the uh, beams and so on. He, he wants uh, to problematize the, uh, the structural system of the buildings he, he, he builds. And maybe, maybe that's not bad. When I look at these windows, you know, uh, as they are with their forms, with their shapes, I think of what Frank Lloyd Wright said. He said uh, something like, uh, you know, architecture wouldn't be difficult to do if, it, if there wasn't for the windows. The windows create a problem. And indeed you make the building, but when you try to uh, find the openings in the walls, then uh, you um, could run into problems because of course you can make those hole, holes in many ways, but how to decide, you know, uh, it's not easy. Anyway, he found a way to, to create these, um, these windows as he did. Angles. Pavilion KA 300, uh, Karlsruhe, 2004-2015. This is an interesting structure. You almost have the feeling that it's falling, that it's falling apart, uh, but it's not. But in, in contrast with the, that, that tower, the old, uh, old tower in the back, uh, this uh, forest of slanted columns is, uh, is provocative.
Well, what we see here is an image of instability. And I think instability is also important in the creative process and in life itself. If everything is totally stable and sure and rigid, we might die of boredom. I think instability could be a catalyst for a new developments, for a change in one's life, for a, a, a change of vision, a change, change of direction. So I think the subject of instability and architecture should be addressed. And if I forget, please remind me to prepare a presentation called just that, architecture and instability. Jürgen Meyer. There is a system here, and this could be a little bit disheartening, but the fact that these are slanted, um, you know, the system is a little bit uh, shaky, but it's still a system, very much so. But the colorful of the, of the furniture, outdoor furniture, and the presence of humans, uh, I think, warms up everything. And then, of course, it's a stage there for art uh, events. And this is the role of art, to create that beneficial instability. Because uh, the bourgeois tries to you know, uh, immobilize everything. But fortunately, the artist says, Epate la bourgeoisie, shock the bourgeois. And the building is attempting a little bit in that direction as well. Uh, we see here, you know, the self-assured tower. And then here is Jürgen Meyer with his uh, slanted uh, structure. Times Square with love, installation in New York Times, another urban insertion of just three benches. Three benches, but you'll see that these benches, not only that they are, um, you know, sculptural, but also functional, but they also, they also connect to the urban context. That's why I say they are, they are as an uh, urban, uh, you know, uh, furniture, uh, contextual and uh, inserted in the urban context. So this piece is here, he designed for the New York Times, uh, for not sorry, for uh, uh, Times Square in, in Manhattan. And he obviously is a, is a, is a love of, of offering, is a gift of the architect to a city he loves because he studied in New York City at Cooper Union. And uh, he was impressed by the city as many other people were impressed. I, it's not just the, I, I just mentioned the instability. Well, here the instability is at power two, so to speak. First is the X. You know, the X represents the unknown as a letter. You know, the X, the unknown. But, but it's also that, that, that this, uh, these pieces of uh, furniture, urban furniture, are um, almost... Um, uh, you know, uh, moving because you see they are a little bit lifted at the edges from the ground floor. I hope I have, you see here, I don't know if they actually move, but they create these um, rather pleasant, uh, uh, you know, conditions for laying and contemplating, laying down and, and contemplating the city. And you see, you probably have to stay in line in order to find a, a free spot the three axes right there. But this could also refer, uh, now I'm thinking of it, you know, usually triple X refers to something that is forbidden. And this is very close to, you know, uh, a famous 42nd Street in Manhattan, which was full of, uh, you know, uh, sex shops and so on. And the tri triple X could be some kind of a reference to that, that part of, uh, of, of human life, which is so, I don't know if he still is, but it used to be uh, very intense on 42nd Street. And here it is, Manhattan, before, before the pandemic. People enjoying these three pieces uh, of uh, urban furniture that Jürgen Meyer designed.
they seem to enjoy them, no? Uh, I think I have the, the drawings also that will understand because actually at, at uh, 45th Street, Broadway and 7th Avenue intersect. So there is there an X also in the, in the, in the, in the site plan uh, in this particul particular area of, uh, of Manhattan. Yes, you see here, it's, uh, I forgot either this is Broadway and this seven, maybe this is Broadway and this is 7th Avenue and they intersect at um, 45th Street and here you have 42nd Street and here 48th Street. So the X refers to the site plan to this intersection between these two uh, important, uh, uh, you know, uh, streets, if we are to call them so in Manhattan. But I also reflected on 42nd Street. Who knows? Maybe there are various possible readings or interpretations of this um, uh, of these three little pieces. But they are not little. But in the context of uh, Manhattan, uh, mid Manhattan, they are just uh, you know three urban uh, pieces of furniture. Jürgen Meyer. Urban insertions, snap, share, like, sky view, my view. He obviously loves Manhattan and loves New York, and there's nothing wrong with that. Now, main campus building in Falkenburg, 2020 here. There is some rigidity in my opinion, but still he is uh, returning to the X and to the slanted uh, structure, the strength, str uh, slanted uh, uh, line, avoiding the, you know, the, the common uh, colonnade. Museum Garage Miami, and now we are approaching the, the end of this presentation about Jürgen Meyer. This in particular I had in mind when I thought of, uh, uh, you know, uh, urban insertions. And I will, I will explain why. Because um, uh, from what I was told uh, for the fourth year students, the, the program asked for uh, a parking for 300 cars, which is an immense amount of, uh, of cars, and I, I, I really hope we will uh, we'll diminish such giant numbers of cars if we still want to breathe uh, a breathable air. But this garage is actually a parking lot, is a parking, is a structure that doesn't look at all like a parking. Exquisite corpse. So let's read a little bit about it. Bringing together these designers is actually the, the design district in Miami, in Florida, uh, where several um, architects and artists were invited to create a, a, a building or to modify an existing building. So bringing together these designers from around the world, Riley drew inspiration from the Sarealis parlor game, Exquisite Corpse, Cadavre Esqui, as the game is known in French, involved a collection of images assembled by various artists with no regard or knowledge of what the other artists have drawn, producing one image whose components don't necessarily match, but flow together as one playful composition. Under Riley's direction, each participating architect was eventually assigned an area and depth to build out and given for free reign to create fully individual designs. The result is a unique modern architectural version of the exquisite corpse. And I, I, I truly believe surrealism could have a, a positive impact on architecture if we uh, choose to inspire ourselves from it. This is the building designed by Jürgen Meyer. Is actually, I, I don't think he did, it's a, it's a parking building, it's a garage. But 
if you look at it from the other side, you will say that this is a most unusual museum. I mean, who will think that this is a, 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 a garage with several floors dedicated to the cars? But why should the garage look, 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 look like a garage? Next door, next to it is another parking and you are going to see the facade of that building as well. So even if you build, well, let's hope, let's hope, we, let's hope we be less for cars and more for humans and even more for nature. But if we are forced to build for cars, let's make the parking, parking uh, spaces as joyous as possible. Like this building, you know, it's a garage. Does it look like a garage? It doesn't. It's a, it's a mask, of course. Behind the mask is something completely different, but it's okay. Jürgen Meyer in Miami, Florida. But look at this building next door where an artist covered this. This is also a parking. You see, you see it says clearly here, parking. But does it look like a parking? This one does because it's uh, you know covered with these uh, vertical cars, but this one you would say it's 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 a parking. So, you know this is the the the, the design district in Miami, Florida. Is it excessive? It is. Is it colorful? It is. Is is it unexpected? It is. But it's nothing wrong to be colorful and unexpected, and even excessive. I think is nothing wrong. Imagine that without these masks, these buildings would have looked like uh, the most, uh, you know, uh, uh, sternly and predictably and sadly, you know, parking uh, uh, structures. This could very well be a, a museum and not a gar the garage of the museum. And I hope one day it will become so instead of the museum garage, just the museum. Or as I first thought it was the case, the garage museum, in other words, you know, play with words in a way. I didn't think it was a parking, but it is. And so is this one. The Baroque is coming back, actually. Ornament is coming back, as you can see. The mask is coming back. And let's hope the trees are coming back too. This one is more banal, anyway. But even, even the you know, ceramic insertions, uh, like uh, sculptures, if we are to call them so, they are, they are returning to the building. And I think this is also saying something that we need back art, we need sculptures, we need painting, we need color, and mostly we need trees and flowers, as we can see in this picture. Art, capricious as it is, may be not very profound, and the beauty of nature. Okay, and now very quickly we'll go to the last part of the presentation. This is a very short. Uh, too short in a way, and I apologize. Uh, Walter Netsch deserves more, but that's what I have today. I had another presentation which I couldn't find, but we'll still pay homage to this very interesting architect who worked for Skidmore, Owings, and Mary, Walter Netsch. So, Walter Netsch, born as you can see, February 23rd, 1920, was an American architect based in Chicago. He was mostly, uh, close, most closely associated with the brutalist style of architecture, as well as with the firm of Skidmore, Owings, and Mary. His signature aesthetic is known as field theory and is based on rotating squares into complex shapes. He may be best known as the lead designer for the United States Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs, and you are, we are going to see it, and its famous cadet chapel. We are going to see the cadet uh, area. Uh, the academy was named a National Historic Landmark in 2004. He was a fellow of the American Institute of Architects. Here he was 
a serious man, an interesting man. Um, I, uh, uh, on the left, uh, another famous designer, uh, Skidmore, Allison, Meryl Bunshaft, Gordon Bunshaft, and Walter Netsch is the one on the right with her other, um, you know, idiosyncratic uh, sweater, if you ask me. Uh, and, and the coat in his arms, was it so cold? It seems that for uh, uh, Gordon uh, Bunshaft, it wasn't so cold, but uh, for Walter Netsch, it was. A truly an interesting man. He is somehow the, the appearance of a nerd, but some people thought he was a genius. Here he is in his older age on the left in his own home. And we are going to see his home visited by architects and, and, and students in architecture. Uh, this is a building I think he built for the uh, Chicago uh, University. He did work very well with rotating squares, creating dynamic structures, almost floral arrangements in, uh, in concrete. Uh, and uh, I think he, he arrived at some, uh, some convincing results. Too bad again that um, you know, he employed concrete, but at that time, uh, concrete was not considered uh, in terms of uh, uh, a very um, you know, annoying polluting agent. The construction of uh, the construction process of one of his buildings. He didn't work for himself alone. He worked within the Skidmore Owings and, and, and Mary firm, a very important and one of the largest architectural firms in the world, if not the largest, which also has a remarkable fellowship program. And I encourage students to apply for that um, very generous fellowship in architecture for students. It's not easy to get it. There is a stiff competition, but uh, there is a chance to, to, uh, to make it if you have very creative work. So what do we see here? We see uh, this field theory where through rotations and rotations and rotations, he arrives at some kind of an ornamental plan. And this ornamental plan shows in, uh, in, in space um, interesting, stimulating, um, you know, buildings. I like this uh, uh, multiplicity in unity that he creates a whole out of a, a field of uh, uh, fragments that are based on a similar um, geometry, like here we see octagons. You know, and with these octagons, then he uh, superimposes on them, uh, uh, you know, squares. Uh, there is complexity within these uh, um, dense uh, architectural organisms. This is his own house in Chicago, and we are going also to go inside. Too bad again, and I apologize. This is not a very ample presentation on him. I promise next year I will make a better one, or this year on the day when he died. Because for those architects who are not with us any longer, I made two presentations, one on the day of birth and another one on the day they died. And he did, he did die. So this is the house he built for himself in Chicago. They say that a shoemaker cannot make shoes for himself. Well, sometimes the shoe, shoe, shoemaker can make shoes for himself and an architect can make a building for himself. This is the case with this building uh, that uh, Walter uh, Netsch built for himself in Chicago. And look at the interior, you know, it's abstracted, it's uh, sculptural, the space is flowing, uh, and it's, it's um, uh, again, it's the same man with the same uh, uh, dynamic geometry, that he employs also in his own in, in his own home. Walter Netsch, happy birthday to you, sir. It's almost surreal. You you don't quite understand what's going on here. You know, is it a photoshopped picture or something? No, it's not.
did he try to mimic the buildings across the street? Of course not. He asserted his time and his place. He asserted the new, he asserted who he was. And here they are probably a class, an architecture class with the students and a few professors visiting the, the building that uh, Walter Netsch designed for himself after he died. It's important to have a dynamic quality in your work because, because without it, uh, too much stability leads to stagnation, to inertia, to conformism, to, to actually not living. Quite a spacious house if all these uh, students in architecture or architects, um, you know, uh, find uh, find the room here. Architecture is beautiful when it says yes to life and when it unites life with itself. And I see such an example here. This is the power of art and this is the power of architecture which deserves its name meaning deserves to be called architecture, to, to incite people, to inspire them, to make them curious. Did he die? No, he didn't die. He continues to live through his works, including his own home. Now, this is a very interesting little, um, you know, it's like a school uh, in Wisconsin. This was published uh, abundantly in the 70s uh, in the most famous architecture journals like uh, L'Architecture d'Aujourd'hui, Domus, uh, Architectural Record, uh, Architectural Review, and so on. Again, the same uh, playfulness with geometry. Why should schools be boringly rectangular? Why? Shouldn't school pro promote some freedom? Shouldn't school inspire students? Because I think it does matter if you study in a school that is generous architecturally and creative and provocative, you become yourself a, a, you know, a person with a, with the desire for freedom and the desire for expression. And, and this is important. Uh, the spaces here are uh, conducive to, uh, you know, be open-minded and not, uh, you know, uh, stuck in the rectangularity of a, of a, of a, of a, of a you know, uh, rigid capsule. Interesting, enticing, exciting spaces create, I think, interesting, exciting, enticing minds. Architecture does have an effect on human life, whatever Peter Zumthor might say. And he said that he lost a long time ago the idea that architecture can, can save life. Okay, it's not true. Okay, okay, it might not change the world. Totally, but it, co it could contribute even a little bit to a betterment of life and a betterment of the world. And if it doesn't, then why continue to build? Uh, this is another building uh, back to the, as I said, this, uh, this uh, presentation is, uh, is, 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 is needs some improvements. But I like this, these children, you know, here in, you know, the, the, the inhabitants, the users of this school. You can tell that, that they, are, they are born to be rebels themselves. And I love young people who are rebels. Yes, because they push the frontiers of life, of the adventure of life forward through their rebelliousness.
I like, I like all of them. You can tell that they are ready to change the world. And uh, Walter Netsch helped them, I would say, have the right state of mind to do so. Library at Wells College, um, even here, you know, how many libraries look like this? People sit on the floor, right? Why not? And look at the ceiling. Another provocation, another inspiration, another, uh, you know, uh, enticing uh, um, expression of, uh, of uh, the need for freedom. particularly the top of the building. And you see the plan on the left and the sections. Don't be afraid to be adventurous. Architecture that is not adventurous is not architecture and it will never be architecture. Good architecture is adventurous. It has to be adventurous. It has to try new things to bring in the new. Otherwise, it's just a construction, just a building. That's it. Nech was the chief, we are ending now the presentation, but not before I show this very famous cadet chapel at the US United States Air Force Academy, which was built, I think, in early 70s or late 60s. And he was the chief architect for this very famous um, chapel built for the military. Uh, this is a picture, but we have a few others. Here it is. I understood that uh, it was considered an adventure within the SOM, um, you know, leading uh, portion of the, the organization, the Skidmore, Owings and Merrill. They took some risks to propose this uh, rather unusual chapel for the military, but they did and it, it proved to be a, an astounding uh, success. That's why I keep telling the students and everybody, be adventurous, be creative, express yourself, believe in what you do, fight for what you do. It's worth it. It really is worth it. Don't, don't, don't follow the mellow road, you know, the complacent, timid, uh, fearful road. No. Have exuberance. Have, have exuberance because Frank Lloyd White was correct. Creativity equals exuberance. Yes, exuberance. Be exuberant. Uh, her, uh, Walter Netsch was exuberant here, uh, using strict geometry, but you can feel that there was exuberance. Look at the, look at the cross section of the chapel. And, and he inspired a newer building on the same campus, and you are going to see it. And I employed that image for the Diagonal Festival, which I uh, initiated uh, some, 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 some time ago, and you are going to see it. But this is the chapel. It has actually two floors. There is um, another religious service underneath this floor. And, uh, you know, color is used. There is some stained glass window there as well. SOM, Skidmore, Rowings and Mary with the chief designer, uh, Walter Netsch for the um, Air Force Academy in the United States. And this is, I think, the last image of this presentation. This building was not designed by Walter Netsch. It was built uh, some years later after he died, but it's, it's, a, it's a very enticing building itself. It's a, it's a, it's a building within the same campus uh, for uh, the development of character of the leaders of the US Army for the Air Force of the United States. And it, too bad, too bad I, I, I don't have other images. I just have this one. But if you are interested to learn more about this building, because it is spectacular, um, I suggest you, you search for, uh, um, you know, the uh, Air Force uh, Academy, um, development center, or I don't know exactly how it is called, but but even if you refer to the chapel that Walter Netsch built, you'll come across this building as well, which is much bigger, much more monumental, and much more impressive than this picture shows. Thank you, and happy birthday, 
Walter Nash.